All right, so it's Legacy Cube time. I haven't played in quite a while due to uh, work, holidays, family, lots of reasons, but uh, I finally got a chance to get on and saw that there was a, a Legacy Cube, so I thought I'd jump right into it. This is the first deck I've played Legacy Cube with um, this year. Uh, I haven't played the format at all, so I ended up drafting a deck that... Um, so this is the... This is what I sideboarded into every single game 100% of the times. Uh, initially, I had a, a little bit of an error in the initial build. I think I had something like, I'll show you some of the cards I'm not using, by the way, over here. Um, so we can go ahead and just um, get rid of the uh, white cards that I didn't use. We'll dump the red cards I didn't use and the green and the white. Probably should have done that ahead of time. Snake I almost used, but I couldn't find a... I saw a Bayou, but by the time I saw it, it just wasn't... didn't make a lot of sense to push for that. Uh, I ended up with these dual lands for um, red if I had wanted to play them. I do have a fetch that could go get Blood Crypt, but I didn't have strong enough red cards to fetch. So anyway, I initially believed that in my, my build, um, I was thinking I'd play some kind of reanimator. So I had uh, Grizzlebrand, Careful Consideration in the main, and I think I had Ever After, or uh, no, Guild of Lotus, that's what it was. So I had a sort of half reanimator build. I didn't use these cards on the right. So Careful Consideration, Grizzlebrand, Lotus. Thinking, okay, well, I can Lotus. If I play a Lotus, then I can cast, hard cast Grizzlebrand. If I can dump Grizz into the graveyard with Careful Consideration or with um, Jace or with Factor Fiction, etc., then I have a way to potentially reanimate him using Animate Dead. And um, if I go long and the game gets long and I, I need to get him back, I have Liliana who could pick him back up. So it seemed to make sense to me. It was definitely wrong, though, because it slowed down my tempo. So it was like, hey, I could just win the game, but I'm going to slow the game down in order to maybe do some trick that might win the game later. That's not a good plan. So um, every game I say I order those cards out, I put in Vapor Snag, Scrap Heap Scrounger. I have no idea why I didn't put this in the main. The card's absolutely <laughs> insane. And uh, the other card that I kept sideboarding in was... Uh, oh, I also didn't main deck Tank Tectonic Edge for no reason at all. So I, I kept sideboarding that in for an island. Um, and then what was the third card? I don't remember what the third card was. That's kind of annoying because I kept sideboarding into the same stuff so many times that um, I guess I just... Oh, Hanger Backwalker. For some reason, I wasn't running that. So Hanger Backwalker, Scrap Heap, and Vapor Snag. These three cards, MVPs... Um, compared to the garbage that I had in game one. So I'm going to run through some games. And if you stick around, I also have up some kind of early review, my, my initial impression of Aether Revolt. I'm not going through the whole set. I'm looking at, I'm playing Commander, which cards belong in a Commander deck? Maybe. Which cards belong in a Commander deck? Definitely. And why? And so we'll go through those. Uh, every format, if you can see even one card that you might want to use, you're lucky if you can see one card you definitely want to use you're really lucky um I, I definitely see a card i want to use and a few and quite a few maybe so it should be so this is actually pretty nice for us so anyway let's run through some games so legacy cube my first draft and i get this opening hand here and decide that it's good enough to keep um my opponent leads off with preordain but it, it is a very slow, like I have nothing going until maybe turn two if I edict something and otherwise turn three. We place a Noble Hierarch, so at least I do get to edict on curve. Turn three plays Yavimaya Elder. I glad I didn't have that thing out when I edict. I figure Wake Thrasher is better than playing a click here because I'd rather, um, I'd rather, um, what I want him to do is stand up two mana to block with the Elder uh, so that I can, um, so that I can slow down his development. I'm still going to attack into it, but that way I can continue, like, next turn I can play uh, my, Delver, my Delver followed by Vendillion Click after he draws a card from Elder, and I'll get to see the maximum number of cards. Alternately, he could do this, which is what the other good thing is, um, if, he, if he taps out to make some plays, then chumps with Elder, he gets two lands, but not a uh, actual card to replace it, so that's good too. So I get Delver down. Send in with my big guy, and he takes just the lands, no other cards, so that's excellent. We got Delver on board. Drew Liliana, which I can't cast. All right, so during his draw phase, we're going to click. And he has 
a response. So Eventers click back to my hand, but that's not bad for me. That's kind of a tempo play. I mean, Wake Thrash will just push through. Delver might go large, so that's not too bad at all. Um, I really wouldn't mind drawing a Swamp here, which I don't do. Um, so anyway, I, I could um, push through with Wake Thrasher, but I decide that for six damage, I'm going to go ahead and dismember that Venser. So I do. Hit him for seven, and then draw phase. Click. So I should win the game here, right? Well, look what he's holding. Inferno, Titan, Sower, Tanglewire. Okay, don't care about Tanglewire. Sower of Temptation, not too bad if he plays it. I mean, it sucks if he takes one of my guys who will be tapped, but... Um, I can I can deal with that if I impulse into a swamp, for example. I've got Liliana to maybe, I don't know. There's there's things I can do. It's the least threatening. Inferno Titan, on the other hand, comes down and does one, one, and one and kills my whole team. So that's out. So now that I don't have to worry about him killing my whole team, he will, of course, kill my whole team. Drawing Chandra Flamecaller. What? And now I'm in some trouble. So I decide that I'll take the control magic here. I'm not sure if that was really right, but um, truth be told, there's probably not much I can do here. He's going to tangle wire me out. And I get to start my first game of Legacy Cube. Losing the game. I can save you some time and trouble. There is no answer for Chandra for me. Um, he gets to just keep sweeping my board, locking down my mana, and hitting me in the face for six while developing. I never draw a black. I never really draw anything of substance at all. And I actually don't have any time. Two hits and I'm dead. So that was game one. Uh, nice stop deck. But you know what? That's the risk you take with click. Now game two. I have a keepable hand. Not great. So I will keep the keepable hand. He gets to lead off with Priority and stuff again. Right into Kiora's follower. So I go ahead and just kill it at the end of his turn. Thinking he's going to need the mana, get down Wake Thrasher. It's a tempo play. He misses a land drop, which is huge. And as a result of that, I'm going to control magic a mana elf. I hit him in the face. Gets down Noble Hierarch. Misses a land drop again. So we are going to kill that with Hero's Downfall. Hit him in the face. And click during draw. And in response to click, he just scoops. There's no, no answer there. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The Wake Thrasher alone will hit him for 7. Um... Yeah, that was a quick game. I like that. Um, of course, game one in the previous game, I wasn't sideboarded correctly. Game two and three in all these games, I am sideboarded correctly. I've got a great hand. Well, any hand with a first turn Delver is great. And then I draw Force of Will, making it that much better. That's insane. Um, Delver does not flip. There's my scrap heap. So we get to hit him for one. Now we're going to hit him for four per turn. <coughs> That's pretty early and pretty fast. But Seagate, but Seagate doesn't really, it blocks Delver maybe. Unless it gets flying, and it doesn't block, block Scrap Heap. And Delver gets flying off a of Forbid. That's brutal. Smash in for damage. Holding up Forbid. He plays Elder. Okay, I'll Forbid. I could have forced here and then played Click. I decide Forbid with buybacks to play because I only have to hold the line for a couple of more turns. Um, two to be precise. So um, he's at eight. He's pondering. He's trying to find a way out from this three, six points of beating. So Slag Storm. All right, we're going to force that and end of turn click. And that's nine points of damage. Dead. Okay. So, games two and three, super fast. All because of the sideboarded in um, creature there, the 3-2. The guy's nut balls. Don't know why I was not playing him. Oh, wow. So, against this second opponent, I get first turn Delver, Delver again. Man, that's what you just want to see. One Delver in your deck, and you want to see it on turn two 100% of the time. I mean, turn one. Alrighty, so I'm holding Edict and Animate dead. Haven't flipped the Delver. Oh, there it goes. Hero's Downfall flips him. That'll work. Unfortunately, he Stagger Shocks him. And I decide the play here is I'm going to he's I'm gonna soak a Stagger Shock on Liliana. I just want to spend the mana, uh, you know, stay on curve. And then he plays Main Phase Gifts. I don't totally get what he's doing here. But I'm holding Animate dead, so I'm thinking this might actually be decent for me. So he had Kir Kirin and something Nalar, the one that makes 2 one one Thopter Flyers, and you can sack an artifact to deal 2 damage to our creature or player for 3 mana. It's a 4 casting cost card. He had Avalanche Rider, Searing Spear, which would just kill Liliana outright, and then he had a 5 drop that lets him recast an instant that costs 3 or more or less mana. So, considering he has the um, 
the red red two creature I, I, I dump Searing Spear and Avalanche Riders thinking what I'll do is I'll reanimate Avalanche Riders, kill one of his red sources. He may not hit in a second red for a while, off the, the which will slow him way down for the Kirin and whatever Nalar. But it also um, puts him down to three mana, which means I have a couple of turns, maybe more, before he hits five. And, it, and then is able to um, play his 4-4 four, four and flash, flash the uh, Searing Spear onto Liliana. And if I can stall for a couple of turns then I have the ability to possibly uh, get her big enough to where she won't uh, die when he does make that play. Uh, meanwhile, I'm hoping to draw a blue so I can just I have my control magic ready to go. This is game one. Of course, I've got Grizzlebrand in my hand. Um, yay. Uh, that would have been my 3-2. Uh, oh, well, or something along those lines. Of course, due to Echo, Avalanche Riders is going to die, but it seemed like the play. Unfortunately, he follows up with a mountain so no dead so i didn't even gain too much tempo but maybe if i can keep him off his five drop next turn so the interesting thing here is i so i don't still not drawing an island but i can i can use Liliana to kill one of the flyers so it's not as worried about the the creature and then i can either um edict or hero's downfall i drew a land though so i can actually do both and just clear his board and so even if he gets the big guy, all I got to do is draw a blue. I can take it, and then my Liliana is safe, or he doesn't draw it, or there's a lot of ways that this can go well for me. So I make that play. He, of course, hits his land right away uh, and doesn't play anything, which is interesting. So I stall for a turn, then he plays end of turn Pester Might. I think about bouncing it, decide that for whatever reason, I guess that would be... The right play he misclicks and i believe untaps my island for me so shame on me i was really afraid that and then he rifts my uh, creature back to my hand and plays tamio so i was really afraid that he was going to um so i play my guy and make it four four i was afraid he's gonna have a um when i see pestermite i think combo right so especially pestermite in a deck with red red possibly triple red so now i've got a tamio i've got to deal with he finally plays the big guy searing spears liliana i cannot control magic it because of tamio my Liliana dies for basically no good reason. He's playing Recruiter now. He recruits up a uh, Moloku. So this is just bad to worse here. Five, six. I have six mana, so maybe if I could draw Ancient Tomb, I could just play Grizzlebrand and do something that way. He's hitting me in for the face, though, and playing Tamiya. I let him have Moloku because I, I really just need to draw a blue and control magic that thing. I draw... Lotus, which is even better. So I control magic it, and then Lotus, he's going to have to tap the Lotus, which means five, six, seven. I'm, I'm one away from Grizzlebrand. Unfortunately, he has another creature who tutors and tutors up um, Revoker and shuts down Moloku. So now I can't even. So even though I can play Grizzlebrand here, there's nothing I can do except draw a bunch of cards that are not going to do any good for me, and I die. All right, so game two, Grizzlebrand's out. Speed is in. And, whoa, hold on. Speaking of speed, so I have an opening hand where the card I said I brought in, there it is, Scrap Heap Scrounger, is in my opening hand with an Ancient Tomb. So I got first turn 3-2. It's like playing a Delver that doesn't fly. Uh, but um, do you keep that? I have no other play. Well, I do. Well, let's back up. I have Hanger Back Walker. I sideboarded that in too. So off of this Tomb, I can generate a 3-2 on turn 1. Uh, a Hanger Back... And then maybe I can do some work. Um, figuring how slow his deck really was, I decided that th I'm going to play super risky and keep the Ancient Tomb hand with no other mana at all. And we're going to go for it. We're going to see how that works out. So, bash. Down comes the hanger back. And I drew an island. This is huge. Now, I think I misplayed here. So on this turn, the right play is really to try to spend all my mana. I should have played Island, Jace, uh, and with the last mana floating, made the hanger back a 2-2 two, two, and then just hit him for 3. But I decided I'm going to hit him for 4 here and play Jace anyway. And waste the mana. I think that was a mistake. Um, so he kills the uh, creature. So I'm just digging for Swamp now. If I had drawn a Swamp... Alright, so... Stagger shocks my hanger back. Probably another misplay. I could have just into the royal the hanger back, and then stagger shock wouldn't flash back. But oh well. All right, so Jace is flipped. 
I'm going face and I shrink his uh, avalanche rider who he allows to die. He's got a stagger shot coming back. And he plays Assemble the Legion. So we're putting that back in his hand. So he's got four cards in hand. One of them's Assemble the Legion. Makes a bunch of 1-1 one, one dorks uh, during his upkeep. All right. So we're going to push for damage. And I guess my graveyard's relevant. So I drew a Delver. Um, Jace has potential targets over here of Hero's Downfall into the Royal. Um, that's about it. If I get a creature in my graveyard and I can get a... Well, I have a creature. If I can just get a black, then the Scrap Heap can pop back out and do some work. Meanwhile, I'm pinging my opponent. All right, so upkeep. He goes for Exarch. Taps an island. Okay, I'm just going to float blue and let it go. Hopefully he untaps it by, by mistake. Nope. All right, shrink his guy. Go face. I did draw a black. I'm really afraid. Like, I'm terrified of uh, Kiki Jiki. So I just don't... I mean, I want to make a, a different play, but I do have hanger back walker end of turn here. So I just sit on murderous cut. He bounces Jace. So, okay. Fair enough. There's Pia and Kieran Noir. All right, so end of turn, I'm going to put the Scrap Heap Walker out so, so, so he's not summoning sick. Draw for the turn, and I get Kira, Great Glass Spinner. So I, I want to kill Deceiver Exarch because I'm terrified of um, him getting his creature down, and also because I was hoping he would do exactly what he did. I send in with everyone but the Delver, and he trades right and left, which is amazing because Scrounger is just coming back anyway down the road. He is at seven, however, so playing with his life total might not have been a good idea for him, so I can understand the thought process there. And he gets Moloku down, but still haven't flipped Delver. I've played this entire game with an unflipped Delver, which kind of sucks. So I throw away Kira. I'm actually, Moloku, I have no direct answer to, and this is starting to get, make me quite nervous. Um... And because I'm nervous, I do absolutely nothing but sit on a forbid, hoping things don't get any worse. So he plays Spell Skite. Now the plan is, the game plan is to flip Jace and then Murderous Cut his Moloku. So I actually have to counterspell the Spell Skite. I don't forbid with buyback. And he counters the counter. So he's got a Moloku running now, and I don't really have a good solution. And look at what happens. Sideboard card to the rescue. I flip Jace, finding Vapor Snag. Vapor Snagging the Spell Skite. And then murderous cut on murderous cutting Maloku makes a guy in response okay, and then with just enough mana I'm going to reanimate his Maloku and try to kill him with it. So he gets the recruiter into um, a uh, revoker. Um, still haven't flipped a Delver, <laughs> but I do get a Glenelundra down. So I get Glenelundra shrink his revoker a little bit, go in for a point of damage face with the uh, Moloku, who I cannot use right now. Down comes Spellskite again, so... And we still don't flip the Delver. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Uh, bad luck there. So I have Glenelendra up, which is nice. So I'm getting in for three. I shrink down one of his creatures. He tries a Searing Spear, which is fine. And then finally, he's going for um, he's going after Jace with the one one. I don't have any issue with that. I have two one ones that I could block with, but I'm not going to because Jace will just take the damage fine. If you were to do it foolishly, attack with the Voker, of course I would have trade and turn on Maloku and killed him. If you were to attack with his flyers, well, you really can't because I've got a lot of damage in the air. Plays Assemble the Legion. I go ahead and just Glenelendra that thing away, which is why we weren't um, planning to uh, play. Um, click right there, and now that Glenelendra is dead at the end of his turn, I can recur the Scrap Heap Scrounger using Glenelendra. And finally, Insect flips just in time for me to go face, and he's down to three. I'm going to click during his draw phase now since I have no tricks. I dump a Pestermite, and he finds himself a land off of the Pestermite. I replaced a Pestermite with the Mountain, basically which is fine. I figured I'd uh, get rid of it because I didn't want... Um, because Pestermite uh, uh, was just one more thing that... I, I Basically, I just wanted to take the chance. I mean, I know it wasn't the best card. He, he could have found a card that could have wrecked me for making that play, but I just felt like um, a Better the Devil I Know, basically, was not the right answer. I felt it was more appropriate to try to just win the game because if I could... Because if I, if I could put the Pestermite away and make him draw 
and and he did draw a land, then I probably just win right there. And uh, and as it turned out, that's what happened. So I figured play to win was the right answer. But also this guy. So now this, that was game two. He's at two twenty six. He spent a lot of time thinking. So he sideboards his deck aggressively, but I have a super aggressive draw. So I'm going first turn Delver. Now I know this game's going to come to time. So as a result of that, I'm going to trade a Delver for a two one with junk abilities. Um, I also I have Scrap Heap Scrounger, and the dead creature means the Scrounger can just keep recurring. So I'm okay with that. So he tries to flash my um, Swamp, and since I want to maximize my mana usage, I go ahead and just click now, dumping a Flame Tongue Kavu and leaving an Avalanche Rider and a bunch of land in his hand. So he kills the Swamp, but I actually have another black. Go in with the team. And I could play Wake Thrasher here or Night Veil Spectre. I think Spectre makes more sense, so this is especially since he's playing blue, even more than usual. So I guess he agrees because he Path the Exiles it. So he Avalanche Rider to Swamp, then pathed and gave me a Swamp. So I, I don't know about all that. Anyway, he's down to 10. I'm going to play Jace here because I want to sit on Murderous Cut since he's got Nexarch. And I'll go ahead and cut now at the end of his turn, which he counters, which is scary. But I drew it into the Royal, so we're probably okay. Take him down to 7. I could play Thrasher, but again, I want to be able to play into the Royal in case he tries to come me out. End of his turn, I go ahead and flip, throwing away Awake Thrasher. Impulse into Hero's Downfall. Of course, I tapped a Swamp to do it, which was uh, unfortunate. Swing and hard cast Hero's Downfall uh, before blockers are declared, so he can block with his 1-4, but not looking too good for him. So he is down to one second um, and four alive. So if he wasn't at, uh, you know, one second on the clock... Um, Jace is about to flip, so if he had some kind of sweep right there, unfortunately I had to tap my black, but I was going to play Ancient, Ancient Tomb and pass. So if he had some kind of sweep, what happens is I activate Jace and flip it so that it doesn't die into the Royal with um, Kicker and pick up my uh, Vendillion Click and draw a card. Um, the 3-2 would then die, but I could just recur it with uh, one of the creatures in the graveyard. So if he did try to sweep, he would have got nothing basically out of the deal. I know it had an active Jace and a, a click coming down along with so one, two, three, and then two extra mana for this uh, scrap heap. So he would have been facing the exact same board except with Jace flipped um, a turn later, and that's if he cast her out the god. Uh, so I think not only was he losing the time, but he was um, just flat out losing, which was awesome. So in round three, another Delver of Secrets. See, this is the key to being awesome people is just um, when you play one copy of a turn one drop you just always put it in your deck preferably with a brainstorm so you can stack your deck and um, flip it on turn two I think that's actually optimal play so I definitely recommend that for anybody anyway my opponent <laughs> my opponent searches for Ophelos um, I could force a will it but I decide <coughs> <coughs> excuse me so I had an interesting choice to make there I could have played Ancient Tomb and just control magic to his Rofellos. I could have forced a will to Rofellos. Um, I decided to do neither. I decided to hard cast Night Veil vale and sit on Force of Will. And the thought here is if he plays a gigantic play like this turn with Rofellos, then I'm going to force the big play and use a force on a card that's more relevant than uh, Mana Source. If he. Um, but uh, I will follow up with the control magic play. Um, but this way, not only do I steal tempo with the Force of Will, potentially, if he goes for one giant move, but I'm going to be attacking for five and hitting with a Night Veil vale with the possible, you know, option of uh, taking his lands and putting him into play and starting to generate card advantage. So um, for those reasons, I think for tempo, it made more sense to play Night Veil vale now and deal with Rafellos later. So anyway, he goes for a Myria Sky Angel. I will force that because it'll stop. It won't stop both flyers, but it, it slows me down, and I just want to win before um, he has a chance to do really much of anything. So I steal his Rofellos. Oblivion Ring uh, goes under a Night Vale Spectre. He plays Elspeth, but Elspeth cannot kill um, little stuff. So we go face and flip, get rid of a wood, uh, Fall Primus. I ignore Elspeth. I could have hit it for five and killed it. But I decide that um, aggression makes more sense, especially because I really was hoping to hit a card with Night Vale, but... I, uh, I hit him for 5 down to 3, and then he draws and has no answer at all to the board. You can make more guys with Elspeth, I don't care. 
So we win game one. Game two. Uh, I have to maul again. And I have a great hand. I've turned two Wake Thrasher along with a... Well, I drew a Vapor Snag. So I can play a Vapor Snag and then Wake Thrasher and have some really good tempo. He's got a pretty fast hand, though, with Fertile Ground. And he's going first also, which is a big deal. Banishing Light, my creature. Draw phase, I go ahead and click him. Seeing Scavenging Ooze, Acidic Slime, and the uh, big um, Persist creatures. So I take the Slime, hit him with the click. Um, decide that uh, since I'm probably not going to be murderous cutting the big guy, I might as well take out the slime now. And he plays fetters on my click. So I've got into the Royal Vapor Snag and a Liliana that I can't cast. Um, this might work out for me okay. He goes for a uh, Elish Norn. So in response to Elish Norn, I decide I'm going to pay some life, enter the Royal to click, then bounce Vapor Snag the Norn. I drew a Control Magic, which is nice. So I hit him with Vess. Um, all right, I play Vess, and then he has O-Ring. So I get to end a turn, click away the Elish Norn, hitting him for some damage, impulsing main phase, finding a Spectre, making the same play I made before for all the same reasons. Let's get the creature down, start going going to town, right? He does have that Windbrisk Heights I got to worry about, but I'm trying to keep him low on creatures. Um, so I hit him here, don't find a land, I, I dump a Rafelos, which is not good at this stage of the game. I'd love for him to have drawn a, a Rafelos. And in fact, I may have drawn him into Green Sun Zenith, which allows him to kill the control magic off of the slime that I put on the bottom of his deck. I take Swords of Plowshares and play a Delver. If he doesn't kill me now, I probably got it. But when I don't block, he plays Mir Mirari's Wake off of the Windbrisk Heights, and that's enough to kill me. Had I chumped with the Delver on the uh, Snake, I would have taken 7... 8, 9, Temet, negative 2. So uh, I, I think I was at 9. I, I don't think I was going to survive had I... Well, I would have had 3 more life. No, I would have been at 1. So if I would have thrown the Delver in front of the Snake here, I, I would have been at 1 life. And maybe I could have won, depending on what else he had going on over there. So bit of a mistake, I think. Probably maybe... But, you know, I mean, I really wasn't seeing the giant growth coming, I guess. Um, a, a mistake, but not a big one. It's more of a hindsight mistake. So, anyway, game three. First turn, Delver. Always good against green. Flips naturally with a brainstorm, ironically. Turn two, Thrasher. This is bad news for my opponent. Um, Thrasher's growing quickly. I'm going to um, hit him for seven here. Brainstorm to set up my next turn. Play land and say go, hoping that since I only have blue, he pumps his uh, guy. He does, and I dismember it in response. And with that, my opponent just scoops. The game's definitely over. I mean, I'm going to hit him for uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm going to hit him for 9 and take him down to 1. Uh, and he's got 2 lands in play. I mean, maybe he plays a land and has 3 lands in play and he goes to 1. Um... Not much you could do to recover from that. And worse for him, what he doesn't realize is I was going to... So take him to one, but I'm also going to play a land and cast uh, El Glenolendra with a blue up. So, yeah. Not coming back from that. Just boom, boom, dead. Which was awesome. And scored me some uh, 220 play points and a pack for my first uh, draft, which is pretty nice. This deck here. So I wanted to talk about Aether Revolt. If you've stuck around and what cards are good in it, let's start with blue because that's mostly what we care about. I'm using uh, MTG Salvation. Um, so, uh, Baral here, instant sorceries, cost one less. Whenever you cast a spell, draw a card, or uh, counter, whenever you counter a spell, draw a card, and then discard a card. That effect is nice. Both of those effects are nice, but not so nice that I would want to play a creature. Um, it's very cheap, and it's a wizard, so it's a no-brainer for the wizard deck. 100% definitely put it in there, but um, for me, it doesn't make any sense in a Laurel. It's not that good in most decks that I would play. So, not playable. Um, but, uh, has a deck it goes in for sure. Uh, disallow. Counter targets, spell activated ability are triggered for three. So, three mana counter spells. We do play a few in Oloro. And I'll bring up the list for reference. But, the three mana counters that we play... It ha they have to be pretty darn good. So, Forbid is pretty darn good. Stoic is 
often two mana, so that's a good reason to play it, and I don't play any others. So is this card good enough to play? Well, I mean, it can kill Planeswalkers that are trying to ultimate. It can kill um, Manlands or Fetchlands early in the game to generate a type of uh, mana pressure. Um, that right there, that second thing I said, might make it worthwhile, because you can imagine playing a land saying, go, opponent cracks a fetch. You disallow it. On your turn, you vindicate. Like, you could set somebody way back. On the other hand, um, if you draw it at the wrong time, you just have basically a bad three counter spell because a three mana counter spell with nothing else going for it's pretty bad. So, basically, disallow is a question mark. If you have a deck with the room for it, put it in. But otherwise, uh, not so sure about that. Most of these other cards are, are pretty much just garbage or or not 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 good enough um, or reprints like negate metallic rebuke on the other hand is really interesting so it's a uh, it's a mana leak for th one more mana but you can tap um, artifacts uh, to pay for the cost so the question then becomes what artifacts do I have that don't already make mana that I could tap pay for the cost, and basically run an extra mana leak, because mana leak's really good, and having an extra one would be really good. Um, so out of the artifacts that I have that I could use to pay the cost, there's there's Reservoir, there's Well, there's Shackles, maybe. Crucible for sure. Um, we've got Winter Orb. We've got um, Scroll Rack, maybe. Uh, there's Sensei's Divining Top. Um, there's kind of maybe expedition map, sort of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards. So there's a possibility that the card is good. It's kind of like the other counter spell. It's a card that you kind of want to play, but um, may not. You, you may not go out of your way for, especially given that. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's just one of those cards that it, it, it's it's a kind of thing that'll make the cut when. You need something for the slot. The fact that it can be cheaper is good along the lines of Stoic Rebuttal. Um, but the fact that you have to work for it just to be as good as a Mana Lake is a little bit bad. So uh, so it, it goes in the firm maybe pile. Um, I could see, again, decks where this card makes the cut. Uh, and I could see that it probably won't in my deck. But um, it's interesting. Now, one, one thing that's interesting in general with improvise and other effects like that that allow you to tap artifacts to pay mana is that uh, you can, when they're instants, you can p tap your winner orb to pay mana and untap all of your lands on your turn thanks to the correction to winter orb that they made. So that right there makes that card much, much better than it might normally be and is definitely worth a thought, uh, maybe a second thought even. So that's a nice that's a nice trick. Um, there is mechanized production over here where um, I could see in a mostly blue deck this card's probably pretty great. It's basically twice the mana of a copy artifact for the potential to draw, essentially produce as many copy artifacts as you have time for. And um, if you're designing your deck for a group, because this has a the effect of um, winning a game um, outright and just beating all the players in play. Uh, Particularly if you're already running copy effects, then I think mechanized production probably is worth a look for group games, uh, but not for one on one. Probably not, just because if you play it and they kill your artifact, you get two for one. You got nothing to show for it. Um, but in a group game, people tend to be a little bit nicer than they should be, and you have a little bit more time to get away with shenanigans. They might give you one copy or whatever. So anyway, um, very few of these other cards stand out, except. Um, Trophy Mage? So Trophy Mage searches for a three mana artifact. So, I mean, let's take a look at what Trophy Mage can search for. Crucible, Shackles, those are huge. Um, Power Stone, Relic, and Lantern are all very solid. So tr Trophy Mage has a lot of targets here. Um, and I think uh, it's a card that Brian and I discussed earlier. More ways to go get some pretty pretty strong effects, particularly Crucible and Shackles. It could make the cut. Um, the only thing is, like, in, in a Lauro, it probably doesn't. Um, in Nin, it probably does. It's also a card you can shoot with Nin, which is great. Um, in a Lauro, it's really... 
questionable because right next to it is the card that you absolutely are going to play probably forever. Um, War of Invention's nuts. So improvise. Uh, it has the improvise mechanic, which lets you tap your winner orb, of course. Um, but in this case, what it does is it's a uh, court of calling for artifacts, which is insane. So you can blue, blue, blue. So on turn three, you can basically fabricate, end of turn, fabricate a uh, Mana Crypt into play. So blue, 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 go get Mana Crypt, put it into play. You can use it right away. Um, so if you had Talismans in your hand, you could just turn three, play this thing, then start casting um, your Talismans or uh, a Talisman. Or you can sit on a counter spell, say done, and at the end of their turn, we're, you know, War of Invention. The fact that this thing also has has x in the mana cost like just going and getting um mana crypt more often makes this card great but the fact that it has improvise for the winter orb trick and it has um and it has x in the mana cost so if you have a ton of mana you can go get you know shackles crucible winter orb guild of lotus like all this crazy stuff um put together a scroll rack combo get reservoir and just win get well of well of dreams lost dreams or whatever uh this card's phenomenal, so this is definitely making the cut, and uh, most likely uh, will not ever fail to make the cut in any deck that's um, similar, runs a similar in a similar way. So, um, the other cards that I want to look at really quickly were uh, artifacts, because artifacts have some interesting things in here, or a little bit of interest. Majority of the stuff is just aggressive, aggressive cards, which is no good for commander, um, but. There is some gimmicky take an extra turn after a million things happen that might let you do that. Um, all pretty bad. There is a couple of interesting things going in here. So first of all, though, there's... Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, okay. So a three-mana card called Inspiring Statuary. So it's an artifact that says non-artifact spells you cast have improvise. Wow. It's actually better than I realized. So your artifacts can tap to play for everything that isn't an artifact, which means, you know, every every other card in here, that, as long as it has colors and the mana cost, it's an artifact itself for three mana. <clears throat> and for that reason, if you can, if you get that thing out with a winter orb, you're never going to be orbed ever. I mean, a counter spell will tap the orb. Anything you play on their turn, you're just going to tap the winter orb. Did you cast a disenchant? Just tap that, tap your winter orb to pay for one and uh, disenchant something. And then, oh, there's my winter orb tapped again, which is nuts. I mean, winter orb, <clears throat> you know, what really wasn't a very good card until now, <clears throat> obviously, right? Anyway, the other thing that's crazy about that, though, is, is that not only will that card act as a mana source, but it has the potential to act as a lot of mana sources. So, um, because we have additional artifacts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to eight, and that card makes nine, so that's nine extra uh, cards that have the potential to produce mana, which previously weren't producing mana. So Eighth of Flux, Reservoir, and Well of Lost Dreams making mana, that's pretty nice. You know, uh, Crucible of Worlds also making mana besides the lands that it's getting for you is really nice. So I think this card is probably gonna make the cut. It is definitely nutty. And uh, so we've got this thing and that blue search card, and I'm kind of excited about both. Really looking forward to testing with both. Um, there's one other thing that jumped out at me in this pile of mostly bad stuff, which is uh, this thing here, Paradox Engine. So whenever you cast a spell, untap all non-land permanents you control. So why is Paradox Engine interesting? Paradox Engine is interesting because of cards with buyback. So um, Whispers of the Muse and capsize in a mono blue deck with paradox engine and tons of artifact mana has a potential to immediately and easily go infinite um i would of course run um in that deck i would of course run uh <laughs> in inspiring statuary so imagine you have inspiring statuary and paradox engine a bunch of other mana mana sources you can tap all your mana sources then tap paradox engine and the other one to pay for uh something with buyback like capsize untapping all of your mana source recasting it indefinitely returning every permanent your opponent controls to their hand or using whispers of the muse to draw your entire deck until you find uh what you need to kill them which may just be casting 
capsize until they concede. Uh, what's interesting about that is, uh, again, in group games, you have the potential to, you know, draw your whole deck, combo out, and uh, make the entire board. Everyone gets uh, nothing. Ex nobody gets anything except for you, basically, uh, with one card and some artifact mana, which are all which are going to be playing anyway. So I think Paradox Engine for group game has a ton of potential. Um, in one on one. I'm not so sure that I would mess around with any um, with the gimmicks like that, but in group where you have a again you have a little more time and also where you just need like more impactful things that um, win the game against everyone, then I think this card gets a lot more interesting. So I would probably play Paradox Engine in group, not in one v one, but Inspiring Stature I think goes in all decks, and that blue search card uh, for sure goes in all decks uh, that can run it. So very excited about those two cards. I don't think there's any good lands that I know of. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand this at all, and it's definitely not interesting. Uh, Spire of Industry is semi-interesting. It's basically a City of Brass most of the time. That doesn't always have to hurt you. Um, so it's a definite maybe. <laughs> a definite maybe. Uh, Spire of Industry is a card where if you can find a, a slot that you can afford to sacrifice in order to play Spire of Industry. You'll probably play it in an artifact heavy deck, but is there such a slot um, in the land slots when you're already running 30 and you need islands for um, shackles and everything? Um, I'm not convinced that there is. There maybe, but it's one of those things where you're in, of course, if you had uh, your chromatic lantern, then um, it becomes even less useful. So it's one of those things where, uh, it, it, it it's possible but also consider you have so many early like one one mana plays that require colored mana or two mana plays that a card like that may not may not really be it may not really be exactly strong enough to uh to play so it, it, it's a possible again um certainly worth t testing but given that it's a rare i don't think i would spend money chasing after it until it's a, a bargain and then i might fiddle around with it and see if there's anything going there. Um, and then I think in multicolor, I didn't see anything in here that jumped out at me uh, really as far as usefulness goes. A sorcery five mana card that doesn't win the game is crap. Um, a six mana card drawing. So six mana for a slow card drawing doesn't produce mana, doesn't do too much else. Uh, gets in the way of my other Tezzeret. Um, it's probably no good. If you notice six mana, this guy draws cards, but he also makes a ton of mana. At a four, uh, five mana, this guy produces additional cards, also makes mana. Um, that's kind of what you need in a planeswalker. Or if it's not going to do either, if it's not going to make mana and draw cards, and it's you know in Karn's case, he just often wins a game outright. So uh, if you're spending a ton of mana on a planeswalker, it needs to be. It cannot be something that slowly generates incremental advantage. That's a bad investment. Um, you don't have time for that at six mana. That's what you do at uh, you know three, two, or one mana. Dark confidant, land tax, uh, you know, dark tutelage. Maybe four mana when you've got a card as strong as well. Uh, streams is drawing two cards per turn. But otherwise, that kind of thing six is just way too expensive. Um, so there is a four mana card that potentially um, this thing makes. Um, Lotus Petals, which is really interesting if you have the card that lets you tap um, artifacts uh, for mana, because you could tap the Lotus Petals for mana rather than sacrificing them, but uh, it's probably, and it does kill creatures also, so he kind of protects himself. Um, his ultimate, though, is pretty bad. Uh, his, and then the Lotus Petal thing, it, it, I guess it's nice, but um, this guy is another one of those possible ones. Certainly not going to spend any money to go get this ultra rare for this uh, creature who gets in the way of the Tezzeret, who actually definitely wins the game. A Tezzeret that goes and fetches Vettelkin Shackles versus this guy. I mean, this guy, the fact that he makes um, Lotus Petals is definitely interesting because producing additional mana at four is really nice. It means it's good against control, and the fact that he kills creatures means it's good against creatures. Um, so he, he could make the cut possibly but again we we're already pushing like pushing the colors pushing um what's going in the deck so deciding how to fit in a card like that um where to 
fit that card into the deck is uh, is the challenge. And the right answer may be that it doesn't that it doesn't fit into the deck at all. I didn't see much else out of here that looks particularly compelling. And then in the um, in the uh, I mean, hidden stockpile is kind of interesting because you can sack uh, sack lands and stuff to make um, free one ones who can scry. <laughs> but that's a lot of work to just scry. There's cards that scry better and we're not using them. So even that, I don't think that makes a cut. Nothing else really looks good. And I, I checked black and white and I'm fairly certain that basically nothing in these colors stands out for uh, um, for us. Uh, sorcery that lets you cast another three mana or less card. Not so great. Uh, very little else looks good here for us. Um, I do see that some of these cards would be quite good in, um, in uh, probably in standard, but uh, not in the commander format. Now in white, there's one card that did kind of jump out at me. Uh, there is uh, a few interesting cards. Um, the interesting cards are, uh, where was the, the one that I was most interested in? Uh, there it is, Consulate Crackdown. And is there anything else? I don't think so. So Consulate Crackdown is really interesting to me. So Consulate Crackdown comes down and it's basically Oblivion Ring for all artifacts your opponent controls. Um, when they kill it, then they get them all back. But the fact that it's a five mana white card that kills all artifacts your opponent control might just be insane for a deck that needs that kind of thing. Um, I might actually do something I don't usually do and drop seal a cleansing for example and put that card in over here so it would be move up so i'm actually hurting my mana cost just a little bit but i put consulate crackdown in there and then i've got fragmentize and disenchant early and crackdown late and the fact is um if i'm in there are games where if my opponent were to resolve that card against me uh, i would just probably lose uh, there are games where my mana base is entirely reliant on my artifacts and i've had plenty of games where my opponent has so many artifacts in play that uh, that a card like that, being able to fetch that and just crush my opponent is uh, super desirable. So, um, especially playing against decks like Mono Blue, trying to do some of the tricks that I was discussing earlier, well, it's very difficult for them to get that card off the table. Um, what it'll come down to for this deck is whether or not so it's it, it essentially is do I want a Wrath of God for artifacts? Um, yes, for my opponent. Kind of like a uh, five mana Vandal Blast. But see, Vandal Blast is flexible. It kills them. They don't come back. Uh, it kills a turn one Soul Ring. This thing's very slow and clunky. Um, more powerful, but it may or may not replace the seal. I will test it. But as far as whether or not it's going to be a permanent swap, I don't know. Because if you look, we've got Vindicate, Anguished Unmaking, that's two, Fragmentized Disenchant, three, four, and currently Seal is five. And I also have Snapcaster, which has the potential to make six cheap early disenchants for artifacts so in that under those conditions you have to wonder when will i actually consulate crackdown and hit more cards than i would hit with a dust to dust which is you know white white one to exile two artifacts or, um and if i'm not going to hit more cards than a dust to dust why don't i just play dust to dust so in order for consulate crackdown to be better than dust to dust i basically have to be hitting three or more artifacts and that, at that point, I'm wondering why I didn't disenchant them first. So uh, basically what testing has to reveal is that my opponent has the capability of playing so many artifacts that I can't keep up, even with all my removal, um, and, that it, and that playing this card would, would be a valuable play. And if I can find evidence of that, then the card will uh, probably make the cut, and I'll probably be happy to have it. But... Um, I don't know. We'll see. So that's all I have as far as Aether Revolt goes. Some interesting cards to think about or look at uh, for Commander. Definitely, you can see the thinking here behind the maybes and such where um, you just don't... Uh, there are cards that... I mean, we have a definite, absolute card for sure in the, uh, in the blue Convoke. Well, I call it Convoke, but whatever. In that card. And as for all the rest... Um, that's what we test for. So at least it's a format, uh, excuse me, it's a set coming 
where we're going to have a reason to test cards from it. That is frequently not the case. And uh, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.